Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to Central while our kids are coming down and meeting their teachers here at the front. And we say this every single week at Central. If you're new here, you may not have heard it. But what we're about at Central Presbyterian Church is we seek the transformation of our lives, our communities, and the whole world through the renewing work of the Lord Jesus. That's what we're doing here. And all of our ministries are arranged around that purpose, changing our lives through the work of Christ. And I pray that's what you experience here, a Jesus who's alive and at work. Well, this morning, we're kicking off our fall uh, series and uh, new Sunday school classes and all the rest, and I'm so thankful you're here, and everything this semester is arranged around the theme of life by design, life according to God's design. You'll hear that in Sunday school. You'll hear it on Wednesday nights at Equip You, and I hope that the Lord stirs in your hearts as we study more deliberately what it means to be made as human beings in the image of God. We're going to uh, study our, anchor our life by design study in Genesis chapter 1, but we'll look at other scriptures as we go through the semester as well. So it's super important for you to bring your Bibles with you. Bring your Bibles to church so you can uh, flip open to the passages and mark them and study them for yourself. And if you don't have a Bible, you can use the Black Pew Bible in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible at home, take that one home with you and use it for your very own to get to know the Lord and His Word. If you were down in the fellowship hall in between the services, you saw there's a resource table. In addition to the Word of God, there are wonderful resources we've gathered there for you, and you'll hear themes from Alan Noble's You're Not Your Own over the next couple of weeks here in our time studying God's Word together. But pay attention to those resources and pick some of them up for yourself. But where do we begin? When we start to think about a life by design, where do we start And I would say quite possibly there's no greater confusion in our world today than this question, to whom do I really belong? To whom do I really belong? Because in our world, we model and we teach one another that we each are our own. We belong to ourselves. And what that means is that my freedom to do what I want is limitless. I'm responsible to choose my own identity, to interpret my own events, to choose my own values, to determine my purpose and express my freedom however I would like to. We're not, we believe and we teach in our culture that we belong to ourselves, but that's not where God starts. God starts, as he says in Psalm 100 and numerous other places, know that the Lord, he is our God. It is he who made us and we are his. And that truth has profound application to how we live our lives every single day. So are we aware of the one to whom we belong? Let's pray as we turn our attention to God's word this morning. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes, that we would see Jesus, open our ears, that we would hear your call and renew our wills that we follow after you as your dearly loved people made in your image. Lord, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. Scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 1. It's on page 1 in the Pew Bible in front of you. Genesis 1, beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And now down to Psalm 8, which is page 450 in your pew Bible, Psalm 8. It says this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, at the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, 
and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. You're not the boss of me. You ever heard me anybody say that? <laughs> Any kids say that? Maybe some of you, I heard some adults say that to each other this morning. You're not the boss of me. Well, who is the boss? <laughs> who is the one who's in charge of us? I think that may be the question of our cultural moment right now. To whom do I belong? If I belong to myself, then I get to define my, for myself who I am. Think about the themes of so many Disney movies these days. They're all about the journey of figuring out who I am on the inside and then the moral imperative of expressing myself. That's the plot of every single Disney show, it seems like, right now. The world around us gives these kinds of stories to tell us who we are, to tell us whose we are. And the message is this, we belong to ourselves. But it's not just stories. Think about how many teens try on different identities to try to figure out who they really are. I know I did. Different music, trying different clothes, different friend groups, trying to find out where I fit to understand who am I really in this world. Adults do it too. Sometimes adults will ask, would I feel more fulfilled? Maybe I would feel more alive. Maybe I would feel more like myself if I were with a different person or if I had a different job. Or I would feel more like me if I lived in a different house, in a different neighborhood, in a different city. We begin to curate these images of ourselves and, and pick an identity that says, I belong to myself, and then I demand everybody around me recognize it. It's the way of our culture right now. It's like we live in the upside down of stranger things, where nothing makes sense, where nobody can define me but me. But I get to demand that you approve of the identity that I choose. No matter what the outside world looks like, whatever I demand, you must affirm. And if I refuse to do that, then it leaves us open to the accusation of denying their personhood, denying your value. Hmm. How do we make sense of the world around us? It seems like it's in a hot mess. But the truth is, if we really want to understand who we are, who we've been created to be, that we need to listen to the God who made us rather than exclusively looking inside of ourselves to get the answers to those questions. We need to be willing to go deeper with the Lord than we go into the media that we consume. Are we willing to go there for the Lord to sharpen our grasp of whom he says we really are, whom he made us to be? It's our question this morning. That's our place to start with our series on life by design. What does the word of God say about to whom we belong? The first answer we get in the scriptures we've read this morning is this. We belong to God as our creator. We belong to God as our creator. Look again at verse 27 of Genesis 1 where God said, let us create man in our image, male and female, he created them. It's God who is our maker. God is our designer. Now, we'll look next week about a little more carefully what that means in particular, but for today, let's think about that word image. That word that we translate image here from the ancient Hebrew has several facets, and one of them is that it was used to refer to statues, it was used to refer to a representational presence of someone in authority. Think about the, a bust of an emperor that would be placed in a town square, and that bust would in, indicate this is the emperor who has authority here. This is the one who's in charge of this place. This is the one who is ruling. Or remember when the United States invaded Iraq, and, and they saw the military on the TV go all the way into Baghdad, and when you got to Baghdad, you saw the standing statue of Saddam Hussein, remember that? And the Iraqi people began to pull that image down. When the image was up, it represented Saddam. Saddam rules in this place, but when the image came down, it represents there's no more Saddam, no more Saddam rules. 
That's what this word image is pointing us to. As image bearers of God, we serve in a way of being a physical means for God to make his divine presence known in this world. That's what we are. That's who he made us to be. Adam and Eve, whom we follow, were commissioned to rule in God's place as God's vice regents. And they ruled, and we rule over God's world as, as his representatives. That's what's behind the verses we read from Genesis 1. We have dominion over the creatures because we rule on behalf of God over all of his world. That's what we've been made to do. So our work matters because it mirrors something that's true about God who is a worker. Our care for creation matters because the God who made it cares about creation. Even your yard work matters (laughs) because it represents something about how God cares and tends for this world. Our caring for animals, our caring for one another for that matter matters because we've been made to be like God, to rule like God, to rule for God in this world. But what about after sin entered? What about after our rebellion and our corruption and sin and death entered into the world through the fall into sin? Are Adam and Eve and all of us human beings that follow still made in God's image and still called to represent him in this world? The biblical answer is absolutely yes. That's what Psalm 8 is all about. The psalm that comes after, far after the fall into sin. And you saw what it said in verse 3. All the grandeur of what God has made, the moon and the stars and the sun, from before which we feel tiny. We feel insignificant before these grand and glorious creations. Yet, verse 4, what is man? Who are we, human beings, that you would take mind of us? In comparison with these great creations, who are we that you would care for us? And then the answer comes in verses 5 and 6. It says, you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. The word heavenly beings, there is the word Elohim. It means God. We've been made a little lower than God. We've been crowned with glory and honor. Now keep in mind, this is describing human beings after our fall into sin. This is describing us after we've been corrupted and shamed by all of our guilt, and yet still God's word affirms that we are crowned with glory and honor. Not because we somehow merited that status, but because of how we've been made. Because we've been made in God's image. No matter your sin, no matter your corruption, no matter your disease in your life, no matter the disadvantages you may have had as you've grown up, we all are made glorious because our God is glorious. And we're in his image. We're made to be crowned with honor because our creator is crowned in honor. And we've been made to be like him. There are things about us that demonstrate who God is. And demonstrates what he's like in this world. Now we'll study in a couple of more weeks the detail about how God's image is distorted uh, in us. But even our sin doesn't destroy it. It doesn't destroy God's image and it doesn't destroy our worth as people made in God's image. You are still glorious no matter what's gone wrong in your life. You are still valued. You're still crowned with honor because of who made you and because of whom you have been made to represent. It's God himself. God shows something about himself to the world through you, no matter how broken down your life might be. This is how one of the most modern of theologians, John Calvin, put it in the 1500s. So we can't accuse him of modern bias. He said it like this. We look upon the image of God in all men to which we owe all honor and love. Yet we may say he is contemptible. He's worthless. But the Lord shows him to be one to whom he deigned to give the beauty of his image. We may say that he does not deserve even your least effort for his sake. But the image of God which recommends him to you is worthy of you giving yourself and giving all of your possessions. Image bearers of God are glorious and all image bearers of God all around the world are worth our time and our effort and our energy even on their worst day. 
Even though the image of God may be marred and distorted by our sin, we are, because we are made like God, every human being is glorious and beautiful and valuable and worth your time and your effort and your compassion. Every one of us. Because of the one in whose image we've been made. Now you may look at the mirror some mornings and say about yourself, not me. I'm a loser. I can't believe the mess I've made of my life. I can't believe what I've done. All these things that I've made this mistake and that mistake and here I find myself in this terrible place. I'm worthless. But it's not true. Friend, your worth, your value doesn't depend upon how you assess your own life. You're made in the image of God. Your worth and your value isn't tied to what the world thinks about you or how other people judge you. It's not attached to your social status or your salary structure. It doesn't matter whether you're thick or thin, whether you're competent or incompetent. It is irrespective of where you come from. Not one of those things adds one bit to your value or worth and not one of those things can take it away because you are of infinite value having been made in the image of God. You've been made wonderfully to be like God himself. It's all of us. But if God is our creator in that way, then it also means that he sets the boundaries of our lives. He's the one who's given us life itself. And he sets us in our places. He sets us in our families. He, he's given us capacities and capabilities. He's given us bodies that we use. He sets us in families and in, in communities. And sometimes that's hard because perhaps he placed you in with hard people. But there's purpose there. He sets us in beautiful cultures all around the, all the, all around the world filled with varied kinds of beauties. And they are there to celebrate because God has placed us there made beautifully in his image. And if God has, has made us to be like him and we belong to him in those ways, then you and I find our deepest freedoms in living according to his design. Not in some construct based on expressive individualism, not having to look inside and decide who I want to be, but we belong to God. We don't belong to ourselves. And he's made you beautiful. He's made you glorious and filled with honor. Are you able to see the beauty of your own life? Because God looks at you with beauty and he crowns you with glory and honor. But not only do we belong to our creator, but through faith, we belong to God as our redeemer. We belong to him as our redeemer. That's point two. There's a, a, a theme in theology that's called common grace. And it speaks of God's goodness to all of creation, all over his, his world, all in his universe. And in a common grace way, everybody belongs to God because he's our creator. But the Bible speaks of something deeper. It speaks of that deeper belonging to God that comes through trust in the work of the redeemer that he sent. Trust in the work of Christ, our Messiah. It, it speaks of a deeper belonging to God by believing that my sin has been slain in Jesus' body as he was nailed to the cross. It, it speaks of a deeper belonging to God if all of my hopes are rolled under, uh, onto Jesus and my hope for the future is, is tied together with Jesus' resurrection and he's going to make all things new. There's a deeper belonging when the Lord sends his Holy Spirit to indwell us as his covenanted people. It describes us as a people that are bound in blood, sacrificial blood, binds us to God, belonging to him. It's one thing to belong to God as our creator, but it's something deeper and more powerful and more beautiful when we belong to God as our redeemer. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 puts it this way. Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. We belong to him as our redeemer. But there's a problem. The problem is that we're slaves to our sin. 
Bible teaches us in numerous places that we're not able to get out from under the corruption of our souls because of our sin. It's not possible for us to be good enough, to be righteous enough, to get out from under it completely and be able to master my own heart and get on the other side of my rebellion. It's not possible for any of us to be permanently free from that selfish drive that said, I live for me. It's a corruption in our hearts. It's a corruption in our lives. And none of us are able to be completely free from that slavery in our power. Can you see it in yourself? Are you able to recognize that? I mean, when I look at my own life, I can't even control my tongue. Much less am I able to control my whole body in perfect obedience to the holy commands of God. And anybody else find yourself in that place? Is there, is there an amen anywhere in here? <laughs> that's who we are. We are enslaved to our sin. And that, that's, that's a description, a great description of what sin does to every one of us. You see, slavery dehumanizes people who are caught in its grip. To have and seek ownership of another human being and it's evil in the past and in the present, in a sense is to deny the image of God in a person. It's to count someone else as having the worth of a thing. You don't have a worth of a person made in the image of God filled with glory and honor. And that's what your sin and my sin does to us. It seeks to assign a value to us as a thing that is owned by it, enslaved by that corruption. I watched college football uh, some yesterday. Maybe some of you did as well. Uh, And you may have seen a player or two in uh, a wildly overconfident fashion taunt another player and say, I own you. (laughs) You see that on the field? You're mine. That's what our sin does to us. Psalm 8 calls sin our enemy, our avenger, and it screams out, I own you. That's what our sin does. But Jesus has come to free us from that dominion. Jesus came to set us free from being owned by our sin that we might belong to our Redeemer and have freedom. Freedom to live as God designed us to live. Freedom to live for Him and have joy in Him. That's why Jesus came, so that we might no longer belong to our sin, but belong to him as our redeemer. The Heidelberg Catechism was written in 1563, but it could have been written last week. You might know that catechisms are uh, tools of uh, having question and answer format for people to master some information that, that, that will help us. And this Heidelberg Catechism written in the 1560s, the first question is very much worth your memorizing. I would challenge every person here this morning to memorize Heidelberg Catechism question and answer number one sometime this fall because it matters. This is what it says. What is your only comfort in life and in death? It's a good question. And the answer is my only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own but I belong body and soul, both in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the dominion of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation." Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily whittling and ready from now on to live for him. That's who you are. God has made you and God has redeemed you. If you've trusted Jesus, if, if you've rolled the hopes of your life, the hope of your eternity all onto the back of Jesus, then that describes who you are. We don't belong to ourselves, but to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And he didn't come, friends, to to give you a list of rules to kill the joy in your life and remove all the fun from how you live your life. He came to set you free, to set us free to live in his power, in his freedom, as he's designed us to live. It's as we recite in our liturgy every single week, I say, Christ is risen, and you respond, he's risen indeed. 
He died for us that we might live for him. That's who you are. The Lord has given his life for you that you and I might belong to him, not just as our creator, but that we might belong to him, our redeemer, by whose blood we've been set free. If you trusted that, Jesus. I'll close with this. Well, before I close, that idea that we don't belong to ourselves, but we belong to our creator and our redeemer is going to be the background theme for what we talk about this whole semester. That will change how you live your life. Because that fact of the one to whom you belong changes how you spend your time, how you engage with family, how open your family is to other people. It changes the value that we assign to our work. It changes how we relate to our own bodies and the limits of our own bodies. It it changes how we view our sexuality. It changes how we view our mission in this life. If God is the one to whom we belong, it changes how we live. That's the background of where we're going for the rest of this semester. We belong to God as our creator, and we belong to God as our redeemer. Now, how close. There once was a little boy who loved to build sailboats. And so he dreamed up this fantastic little boat and he built it all by himself. And he took it out to the lake that they had behind their their house in their neighborhood and he set it on the water. And as soon as the boat was put in the water, a strong wind came up and it blew his little boat all the way to the other side of the lake. And so the little boy trotted along all the way around and looked and looked, but couldn't find his boat on the other side. And he was devastated. A little while later, he was walking down Main Street in his little town and passed by the plate glass window at the pawn shop. And he looked inside, and what did he see? It was his boat. It was in the window of that shop. So the little boy runs into the shop and tells the storekeeper, that's my sailboat. I designed it. I made it all by myself with just my hands. It's mine But the shopkeeper shook his head and just laughed. And he said, son, that boat belongs to me. And if you want it, you're going to have to buy it from me. And the little boy rushed home, gathered together everything that he could think of that, that was worth something in his life. He opened his piggy bank. He got other toys, everything he could think of that might matter, that might be worth something. He gathered them all together, ran back to the pawn shop and threw them on the counter and said, here, sir, I've given you everything that I have. So please give me my boat back. And he did. The shopkeeper gave the little boy the boat And as he walked out of the shop that day, he screamed loud enough for everybody to hear him. Little boat, you are twice mine. I made you all by myself. And now I bought you back. You are twice mine. And I want you to know, friends, as you and I are those little boats. And our heavenly father loves to cry to the heavens and to all the world, you are twice mine. I made you, I designed you, and by the blood of my son, I've redeemed you that you might live in freedom. Live with me. Can we trust him and follow that God who's given us life and given his life for us? Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would help us to see the beauty of your design in our lives. We confess that we've messed it up. In so many ways, we have messed it up, we are messing it up, and we shall mess it up again tomorrow. And yet, Lord, we know that we belong to you, not just in the way that you made us, but you've redeemed us. You've you've forgiven us for our sin because of the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, and you've taken our penalty, and you've set us free. So, Lord, would you set us free to live for you, to walk with you, And know the delight of having fellowship with the one who made us and has redeemed us. Help us to see ourselves that way, Lord. And help us in compassion to love others into that same kind of relationship. Into that same, that love that we have found from you. May we be agents to share that love with the people around us. Lord, give us that purpose, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.